All right, ladies and gentlemen, our last presentation conversation for the day. Please welcome Senator Jeff Flake. <laughs> All right. Senator Flake, uh, we're, uh, we love that he's here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> It's good uh, to be here. Yeah, so, so Senator Flake was gonna, he was gonna do like a, a speech today and uh, yesterday he ran into me and he's like, Davis, actually I wanna change the format. I wanna have you interview me. And I was like, ah, let me think about it. I can think of someone better than me to do the interview. And uh, Nobody better. Nobody. So uh, thank you for letting me do this. But yeah. I'd love to, uh, so Time Magazine came out with the 10, uh, the 10 best images of 2018. And there was a picture of you that was, that was pretty great um, that they called the man in the middle. And so uh, I'd love for you to kind of talk about um, what it's like to, you know, what it was like to be the man in the middle in Washington. <laughs> well, sometimes it's no fun because you're, you're getting hit from all sides. And the, 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 the picture describes in the Kavanaugh hearings when I ask for a one week delay to have the FBI investigate. And uh, that was really, the man in the middle at that point. The problem right now in Washington is that every incentive is for elected officials to, when a big issue comes along, whether it's debt and deficit or climate change or gun policy or Kavanaugh, anything like that is to rush to your corner to get with your tribe and never indicate at all that you might be persuadable or that a hearing that you might be holding or a, an investigation that's going on might influence or inform your vote. Because if you indicate that, then you're the man in the middle and everybody is going after you. And it's not a comfortable position to be in. So everybody now just rushes to their corners and that's part of the problem we have right now. So I think we saw this in Washington, um, I think this was just about two years ago, uh, when you guys were playing baseball. Um, a, a bunch of, uh, of congressmen playing baseball, uh, and there was a shooting, a gunman okay. shot, I think over 100 shots. Um, Steve Scalise was, was wounded right. along with maybe some others. Um, talk to us a little bit about that, about that experience. You were on the field. That was an awful, awful day, obviously. I was between home plate and first base when the first shot rang out. And we didn't know what it was until a few seconds later, a volley of shots rang out and our third baseman said, uh, there's a shooter, shooter. And I just remember that the enduring image I'll have is turning toward the dugout and just running, the only cover I could find, and seeing the bullets pitch off the gravel in front of me. And think, I was thinking at that time, why us? How could somebody look at a bunch of middle-aged men playing baseball and see the enemy? And that's where our politics are right now. Uh, this man had been ginned up by uh, talk radio and, uh, and everything else, and they, he, he died on the scene, um, and they found on his body a, a list of Republicans that he was going after. And it was but a terrible scene. I had to rush out to Steve Scalise and plug up the wound with my batting glove and, uh, and then get his phone and call his wife uh, so she wouldn't learn from television that her husband had been shot. So uh, that's, that's where our politics have gone and uh, we've got to get it back. Yeah. I know that uh, you and I both share a love for survival trips. And, uh, <laughs> I'm jealous of some of yours. Uh, you've done some good ones. So uh, I love, you go to some pretty extreme measures. Uh, so I'd love, to, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the extreme measures you've gone to promote bipartisanship. <laughs> well, I, I did my first survival trip uh, 10 years ago. I, I love reading books uh, about survival. Sa sailing adventures gone bad, that's my favorite genre. So I went alone uh, for seven days and seven nights with no food or water, just marooned on an island in the Marshall Islands and just to see if I could survive. And I did, and uh, uh, a couple years later, I took our two youngest sons back to the islands, just a different island across the lagoon. And then when I got to the Senate, uh, you know, the partisanship was so bad at that time, I thought, 
we'll go to extreme lengths. And so I got up with uh, Martin Heinrich, seen in this picture here. Martin's a Democratic senator from New Mexico. And uh, we decided to maroon ourselves on an island for a week and uh, to prove to our colleagues that we could get along. So we went there with just basically a machete between us, no food, no water. The Discovery Channel came along. They wanted to film it. <laughs> they, they did. This was not naked and afraid. But <laughs> afraid, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we did survive. It was a great experience. Uh, we got back mm. and went on the circuit to talk about uh, you know, this bipartisanship. Uh, I remember we went on David Letterman, and then we went on, uh, uh, well, Stephen Colbert ran a clip of us, you know, Spear and Fish or something. He said, Flake and Heinrich proved once and for all that Republicans and Democrats can get along if death is the only option. <laughs> so, so for what it's worth, we've empirically proven it. But it was a, it was a great experience, and uh, it's not out of my system yet, uh, so stay tuned. Okay. Um, last year, we watched some pretty high-profile um, hearings right. in Washington with, the, with tech leaders. Um, what's in store for us uh, in the tech space with regulation? Well, certainly, I think that the Facebook hearings were kind of a Rubicon that we've crossed now, and Congress feels much more of a need to, to regulate and to get ahead of the curb. Um, during that particular hearing, you know, Congress is not well equipped to do this, certainly. Uh, one of the late night comics pointed out after that hearing that at least five of the senators uh, grilling uh, Mark Zuckerberg, their email password is still password. So <laughs> it may, may indicate <laughs> where we are in Congress in terms of level of sophistication on these issues. But uh, I will say that uh, there is a real need for the tech community to get ahead of the curve here and to make sure that this mood to regulate, which is both bipartisan and bicameral right now, uh, doesn't end in, up in some kind of GDPR-style regulations that would really stifle innovation. And I think we are one data breach away, or one big privacy viol violation away from Congress moving in, moving quickly, and, and passing legislation which uh, even if it doesn't affect your specific business here, the knock-on effects may. And so I, I think there's a real need for the tech community here and everywhere to, one, differentiate, to explain why their business is different, perhaps, from some of the bad actors or those issues don't apply to them. And two, to, to educate, to educate members of Congress, their staff, the regulators uh, who are task with uh, imposing, or I'm sorry, interpreting the laws and, uh, and uh, passing the, or imposing this regulation. So it's important because uh, we don't want to stifle innovation. Uh, you married a wonderful woman. Uh, Cheryl is fantastic, but I've never seen her so happy as I have the last few weeks. Uh, <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the decision you made in October uh, 20, I think it was 2017, when you decided, when you made the announcement that you were like not going to run for re-election. Yeah, I, I decided at that time that uh, there really wasn't much of a path for a Republican like me in a party like this right now. And uh, I just knew that uh, to win a Republican primary in Arizona, I would have to adopt positions that uh, I just can't adopt or condone behavior that I can't condone and ultimately would have to <laughs> ultimately I would have to be on a campaign stage uh, with the president when people were shouting lock her up and and things like that and I just couldn't do it so I gave that speech uh, in October of uh, of 2017 and that photo was Cheryl and me walking away from the Capitol with the press all in tow, but the look on Cheryl's face, and, and she calls it the, the, the look of relief. And so there is quite a bit. Uh, there are good people in Washington. We need good people to run for office, and I hope that this fever does cool. Uh, you served in Congress first, and then later as a senator. So for 18 years, you were in Washington. Uh, what was your most memorable moment uh, in, in serving our country? 
the most memorable, I think, was uh, I've always had this crazy notion with regard to Cuba, and it's been a position that my party hasn't generally shared, that if you want to get rid of the Castro brothers, just make them deal with spring break once or twice. You know, that would, <laughs> they would wave the white flag. And so I've been trying to lift the travel ban and, uh, you know, once again, uh, have diplomatic relations with, with Cuba, and that would nudge them toward democracy a lot faster than anything else. I had passed legislation early on uh, that I couldn't get President Bush to sign. Then by the time President Obama came in, I couldn't pass it. He would have signed it, but I couldn't pass it. But I did work with him on areas where we could increase uh, travel to Cuba to uh, you know, build up the entrepreneurial class there. And uh, we couldn't move too far because they were holding an American named Alan Gross. He'd been in prison there for five years, being accused of being a spy. And I'd been to see him in prison, uh, and he was at, his, at wit's end about that time, ready to take his own life. So at one point, uh, I got back to the White House and said, please negotiate for his relief, release if you aren't. And they were, and uh, a couple of weeks later, I was called to ask if I would go down to Cuba to do a, a spy swap, a prisoner exchange, just the Cold War era style. This was in 2014, and so I did. Three planes went to Cuba. I was on one of them. We were to pick up Alan Gross. Another one was to drop off three Cuban spies held in U.S. prisons, and another one to pick up a U.S. Uh, Cuban national who had been a spy for us. Alan Gross was there in the picture. He'd lost over 100 pounds, lost most of his teeth, and uh, Anyway, but we were re reunited with him. We got on the flight 31 minutes after we'd landed in Havana. And uh, 30 minutes into the flight, the pilot came on and said, we've now entered U.S. airspace. And I'll never forget, uh, Alan Gross stood up and just shook his fists in the air and then just breathed in and out several times and just said, now I know I'm free. And it was just uh, an incredible feeling that uh, probably never have again, but it was just neat. Mm. So uh, over the last few months, we've been talking here and there, and you've kind of been updating me on some of the fun things that you're working on. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you tell everyone what, what's, what's next? You know, you've, uh, you're free as well, and uh, you, you know, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> Well, it has been uh, quite nice to not have to worry about votes. I was actually supposed to speak here on this day last year, last year but we had votes on a, on a Friday. Um, I've been concerned uh, for a long time, as we know, about the lack of common ground in Washington. We just can't seem to find it. But while common ground is uh, scarce in Washington, it's alive and well everywhere else in the country. And so I'm partnering with CBS. It was announced uh, this, just this week to do a, a series uh, called Common Ground, where I will go out around the country uh, with them and do some interviews to, to talk to people, whether they're on city councils or county boards of supervisors or school groups or associations or businesses that merge uh, to, to find out how they found common ground and report on it. And then go back to Washington, and, or I'm sorry, New York, to, uh, to talk about what we did. So. With CBS, we'll be doing that, and uh, we'll be playing a little more with our four grandkids. We'll be spending more time in Utah, particularly in the summertime, and uh, then doing some board work as well. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, about the future, and I, I hope to continue to, uh, to play a role to bring our parties together and to make sure that uh, this toxic environment that we have right now um, doesn't remain because we have huge issues to solve. And if we continue with this, this partisanship, uh, we're never going to solve them. Senator Flake, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Senator Flake. Thank you, Davis Smith. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen.